Hello, everybody. Welcome to Rewind to Dynamite. It's John Pollock here alongside Wei Ting on this Wednesday evening. Happy June the 10th, Wei. Uh, sure, yeah. Happy June the 10th to you as well. Sure. What significance does it hold for you? Uh, June 10th is the day that Steve Austin walked out of WWE in 2002. Is that right? Yep. Damn. Did you know that or did you do some research? It's because it was in my update today. Thanks for reading. Oh, okay. Well, um, I did read it. I, I guess I didn't get to that part. It was really just the video portion uh, that was there. But nonetheless, yes, that occurred uh, 2002, 18 years ago. Very interesting. Okay. Mm-hmm. So there, that that happened on this day. Um, that's it. Uh, that's 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 the main thing. On this sure, day somebody had a birthday today. So happy birthday to whoever, whoever's birthday it was. Yes. How was your day? Did you celebrate it like a birthday? No, I did not. No. Um, yeah, my day was pretty usual, pretty typical. Nothing out of the ordinary. Well, that's uh, that's fine. That's a fine way to spend a Wednesday. How about you? Uh, I went out for a bit today, did some walking. Went to a coffee store in which I ordered my coffee while wearing my mask properly. So that that was good. I got over the hump of communicating to someone while wearing the mask, which has been uh, an issue for me. But I, I it was fine. How did probably you get, spoke? How did you get around it? I probably just subconsciously just spoke louder, but it's it feels awkward. Like maybe it's my mask, maybe it's just in my head, but it's really awkward to talk to someone when you've got this material over your mouth it's like i'm uh i'm muzzled and i'm trying to communicate but they they made out my order fine maybe we should just carry megaphones just to amplify that's, our that's not the answer that that's definitely not the answer that would drive what? me insane no i think so i think as part i think they should build in megaphones into these masks with moving I, with moving like an led screen of our lips moving okay um this sounds like a lot of work and probably something that would be very pricey. Um, I'm just going to yell through my mask. That's what I'm going to do. You could do that too, sure. Well, coming up tonight, we're going to chat about Dynamite and uh, what went down at, at Daly's Place and some matches set up for next week, a new match for Fighter Fest. We've also got uh, a bit of news to go through as well. But this being Wednesday, that means it's time to give away some free stuff. To our cafe members. Absolutely. Every Wednesday on Rewind of Dynamite, we give out one shirt from store.postwrestling.com, which is our, our official merchandise store where you can find a lot of post wrestling shirts, all of our post wrestling shirts. And you can also find our latest offerings, including our Rocky My Via Picture Show t shirt, as well as our post pro res t shirt. So show your support for our friends uh, or just post wrestling in general. Grabbing a st- grabbing a shirt at store.postwrestling.com. I said I just said all that just so I can, um, you know, basically let this page load. So it's loaded now. So all cafe members as well, you can go right now and check out our latest rewind away, reviewing Raw from May twenty first, two thousand one, featuring Steve Austin and Triple H taking on Chris Jericho and Chris Benoit in the main event, along with Kurt Angle reenacting his gold medal ceremony as he has reclaimed his gold medals that were stolen by Chris Benoit. They have been reclaimed and he is going to be confronted by Shane McMahon for an all time segment. It was pretty bad. Yeah. But that tag match was great though. Tag match is very good. 19 years later, it's still a really great match. Uh, incredible crowd. And we talked a lot about that whole era of WWF. This is 
uh, you know, just before the invasion is about to begin. And this is the match where Hunter tears his quad. Um, it's a very pivotal night for the company for their their year. Yeah, I really enjoyed talking about not just the match, but the entire show itself. And we we actually went quite quite longer than I expected. Absolutely. And certainly the show uh, is longer than Raw was. I know. I know. <laughs> I'm always like a little self-conscious of that, but there was a lot of great discussion in there. And our, our guest, our executive producer who chose the show, Brian Schick had a lot to offer as well. So do check that out. You can get all of that. Plus this week's Rewind to Smackdown, Total Recall, our MCU review of Endgame coming up next sun, uh, next Tuesday, all for just $6 a month at postwrestlingcafe.com. With that said, is the page loaded? Are we ready to give it's away a shirt? Loaded, yeah. All right. Way, you know what? He's not going to dig deep. He's taking the name that's right at the top, and that person is the winner. Well, congratulations to... Oh, boy. All righty. Let's congratulate here Kieran, Kieran Joyce from Great Britain. And he's Kieran Joyce from East Sussex in Great Britain. Congratulations to you. You win a t-shirt from store.postwrestling.com. Congratulations. You are the uh, the proud owner of a brand new post wrestling t shirt. We we hope you enjoy. Uh so if you're a member of the post wrestling cafe, you're entered into this draw each and every Wednesday to win a free shirt along with all of our bonus shows. As we mentioned, next week, next Tuesday, it is our review of Avengers Endgame with the the post wrestling MCU Avengers joining together as we've got Brent Chittenden and Nate Milton joining us for a big discussion of Endgame. I feel like that one, uh, we'll see if it's as long as Endgame itself. I certainly hope not, but I mean, if it is, I wouldn't be surprised because there's definitely a whole lot to talk about that movie a year afterwards. What would have happened if Endgame was coming out this year and it got delayed? Dude. How much how much anger would there have been and frustration if that had been scheduled for this year, and they had a two-year gap between that and Infinity War. Well, if there's anything to get people back to the theaters, I think it would be something like that. Uh, but then, then again, like I certainly thought about this, you know, like the 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 period in between Infinity War and in, and Endgame is uh, like an incredibly dire period in the MCU, and to have that, I guess, somewhat reflected in real life with mm. what the world is going on right now. I mean. It, it, Imagine like the thrill that we would, you know, have watching Endgame, like after all this is done, you know, for the first time, and just like it's it's exactly like sort of the hope that I think a lot of people need. But anyway, more more of that discussion later. So Mar Marvel was telegraphing things at the end of Infinity War. That was that was twenty twenty. Yes. Yes. All right. Let us move on to. Uh, some news items to run through, and uh, one of the big stories today was the passing of a very legendary figure in pro wrestling, uh, Johnny Walker, Mister Wrestling Two, uh, a pro wrestler that uh, you know gained great fame under a mask as Mister Wrestling Two, but also had uh, quite the career prior to that as uh, as Johnny Rubberman Walker, where he wrestled and got the nickname from Paul Bosch because of his uh, flexibility and a lot of his his style. And, you know, he, he wrestled in the Southeast. He even came up to Canada for Stampede Wrestling. And by 1972, he was semi-retired. He had bought a gas station in Tennessee and was running that when he got a call from Jerry Jarrett to come to Georgia. And they were going to put him under a mask as Mr. Wrestling 2, because at that time, Mr. Wrestling 1, who was uh, Tim Woods, was uh, out of the territory, but was ended up, as, as it turned out, would come back and end up teaming with Mr. Wrestling 2, and they became quite the tag team together in Georgia. But that's the period most are going to associate with Johnny Walker, because this is when uh, Georgia is getting onto the Superstation, and therefore the the coverage that that territory would get would be enormous across the country. And he just became this ultimate baby face uh, throughout the seventies and into the eighties uh, in Georgia. And one of his biggest fans was Lillian Carter, who was the, the mother of future U S president, Jimmy Carter. And she would come to matches in Columbus, Georgia. And this began a whole relationship with the family 
that led to Mr. Wrestling 2 getting invited to Jimmy Carter's inauguration in 1977. And he couldn't go because the Secret Service would have required him to unmask. And he just said, I can't do that. So he did not attend the inauguration. But this there's a very famous photo out there of him uh, in a headlock by uh, from Jimmy Carter. So there you go. Uh, Donald Trump, certainly not the first U.S. president to have uh, ties with professional wrestling. But uh, it, it was in Georgia that he, he won numerous championships, both as, as a single star, winning the, uh, the Georgia Heavyweight Championship 11 times. He also won their version of the tag titles with several different partners, including uh, Tim Woods. And then after Georgia was when he went to Mid-South and did a, a pretty well-remembered angle with a young Magnum TA where he served as his mentor and trained him. And they did all these vignettes together. And then it led to this turn by Mr. Wrestling 2, who had been this this babyface forever, turning on his protege. And then it ended with Magnum winning the Mid-South North American Championship from Mr. Wrestling 2. He would continue to wrestle uh, when Vince McMahon went national, he came into the WWF, but was more so there as an enhancement talent. And then, you know, uh, wrestled around in uh, in the southeast of the U.S. up until 1990 and then called it a career. He did come out of retirement once in 2007, teaming with Steve Carino, who became Mr. Wrestling 3. So he did that match uh, really late into his uh, in his career uh, at 73 and another interesting note was that his wife, who, who died in 2000, was also this very famous seamstress who designed a lot of Ric Flair's big robes and many other wrestlers as well as uh, other celebrities, musicians. So she was an extremely talented seamstress. And yeah, she died in 2000. And, you know, he was he was if you grew up with Mr. Wrestling 2 or followed Georgia Championship Wrestling, uh, certainly one of the a major name in pro wrestling history he was uh, 85 years old. And the news came out uh, this morning of his passing. But it's a really interesting career to look back on from a uh, bygone generation. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. To have sort of like, you know, to be retired and then sort of like come back and having your, I guess, most popular run. After that, um, that's really quite the achievement. And it's, um, I guess it's, it's nice to hear about stories of people who have like lived these great full lives, you know, in, in this industry. Yeah. And, and not so removed either that, you, you know, there is still quite, quite a lot of his footage that you can find on YouTube. Uh, the mid South stuff is on the WWE network that, you know, it's not all preserved, but there is, you, you can get, um, a flavor of uh, Mr. Wrestling too, if you're going down a rabbit hole just to check out uh, some of his stuff, you know, someone that was, you know, um, definitely benefited as well from being under the mask. Like he, he didn't get that, that role until he was, you know, approaching, he was around 40 when he, when he started that, that gimmick and the mask added years and years uh, to his career uh, after the fact. So if you'd like to read more, and I also put up some clips that's up on the main page of the website, looking at, at his career. New Japan put out uh, their guidelines for these upcoming shows. Um, Way I know you got a chance to, to look through this. They number one, I think they're pretty thorough in terms of the amount that they have thought in terms of just the logistics of running these shows. And I mean, this is several pages of rules and uh, protocol that's in place. Uh, what, what did you think about the guidelines when you saw them? I think when, you know, we saw the announcement that they were going to come back, um, I had expected that they would perhaps be uh, maybe like as thorough as, as they could, as as they reasonably could. And I was interested to see exactly what that meant. And it seems like from here, it means, you know, I, I would say um, pretty much like I, I was very satisfied in, 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 when I say that, because um, it seems like it's short of testing every single person walking through that building. I feel like they are taking like as many precautions as they can. And that includes mandatory face masks. That includes, um, you know, uh, 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 temperature checks for every person walking through the door. That includes uh, a declaration of compliance and also contact details so that they can uh, facilitate contact tracing. If any person were to uh, uh, get sick uh, after the fact, which I think will be a really daunting task, but I, I look forward to seeing, uh, you know, how, how they, how they go about it. 
Because um, even at like what four thousand people, those are going to be really big numbers. But mm-hmm. it seems like they've they've certainly thought out thought about a lot of it. My favorite though was how they recommended um, if you're going to talk to somebody, um, make sure you do it two meters apart. And they strongly recommended no loud cheering. <laughs> this is my this is my dream event to go to. <laughs> for, Stay away from me and shut up. <laughs> they're gonna have a tough time enforcing this for for Russell Kingdom if if there's gonna be any travelers. I'll I'll say, but yeah. Hey, hey, to to his credit, uh, WH Park was exercising this at the dome that that second night that we went. I mean, he left the busy crowd where we were all confined, and he went off to sit by himself. He was ahead of the curve. Oh, he was way more than two meters apart. He, he probably would have spent even more distance, and he's maybe he'll reconsider the Tokyo Dome this year. These guys are fucking annoying. <laughs> I'm going to be sitting over there. Fuck. Yeah. What did you think? Um. Yeah. I mean, my first thought was, that, you know, they that this is not something that they have just thrown together. They have put a, a lot of of thought into this. Um. A lot of it seems to be more so from a fan perspective. I would be curious, like we know about the antibody testing, but I, I think that's still a question. Is there going to be COVID testing among staff and wrestlers? That was not outlined here, and maybe they're not going to be go- going about that. I, I I don't know what the right answer is now. I think that we're getting so much different information that it's kind of hard to to parse like what is the right method what is safe there is a lot of concern right now about is too much being done and are we setting ourselves up for like i feel we're at the point now where it's people are just willing to take chances and we're going to see what the results are and i don't know how uncomfortable people are with that notion that you know we have we have tried isolation and now it's we've there is some risk involved um and, and running a show with potentially 4,000 people, uh, there's risk that comes with that. Um, but this is certainly, you know, they're w- – w- and enforcing all of this as well is going to be something as well. But mm-hmm. – uh, and long term, how is this going to change uh, facets of their of their industry as well? Just a lot of these things, are they going to be temporary or are these going to be more permanent things that we see? Because it's going to be a long time, I think, until people are comfortable – with uh, going back to the way things were run before, this may be uh, sort of a blueprint of how wrestling shows are going to look for quite some time. I think much of it will depend on um, the the rate of infection currently in the area that, that it's taking place. And it's important to note that uh, New Japan Pro Wrestling has stated that it, this is not Japan-wide. Like, they, there are separate rules, I yeah. guess, uh, according to where they might be running these shows. And certainly for North America, I hope that, um, you know, we are taking into account what the what the rate of spread is like in that particular part of town where a show might be running before we start to you know just open open the floodgates right so i i I, you know listen like we are certainly at the point now where i think economically things are um in many situations like pretty dire and so i think people are willing to start to take more risk Mm -hmm. you know yeah i i think that's where a lot of people are at this point. Uh, Raw from Monday night, it was almost, you know, the last four episodes, including this week, they've all been fairly close in terms of what they've been attracting. This was uh, 1,737,000 viewers. So this is still, you know, on the low end all time. Uh, first hour did uh, 1,827,000, small dip in the second hour, and then the third fell down to a million. 595,000 viewers. So this would be their fourth lowest number overall uh, in their modern history. And their while the, the hours were fairly, um, well, the third saw the drop, and there was a real big drop among females between the ages of 12 and 34 in the third hour. They were down 25% from the first hour. So that that's pretty sizable to see a quarter of that audience uh, fall in the third hour. But... The main demo was up 8%, and without news being as uh, viewed as it was last week, Raw was back up to uh, higher slots than than usual and were more near the top of the cable charts. I see. Okay. Um, do you draw any conclusions uh, You know, as far as content of this particular edition of Raw goes? I think it's more so just the pattern that 1.7 million um, to 1.8 million is the new range that they've fallen into. And that seems to be uh, where they are 
going to be. That seems to be the new pattern that we've seen for four weeks in a row. And I, I think that that's largely where it's going to stay for, for the time being. Um, I'm, I'm not at the point where I just, I don't read anything into this, but um, what what is notable is the fact that, you know, since they have added, you know, some, some fans to improve the atmosphere that hasn't had an impact on ratings. Right. Uh, what else do we have here? This came out on Tuesday that MLW has uh, signed a distribution deal with the zone. And this is going to see MLW programming appear on the streaming service, which on its surface sounds like a big deal for MLW. The zone um, has publicly had some, you know, big issues throughout this pandemic. Um, the Financial Times had done this report on DAZN that they have been looking to raise capital. And over the next several years, they have something like $5 billion in sports commitments. They've gone out and just signed and spent ridiculous money that you would think MLW is something that would be uh, – I, I don't imagine that they signed them to a nine-figure multi-year deal like they did with Bellator. But for MLW – just to get um, any chunk of that would probably be a game changer for that company. And I guess that's the the big question is what the financials are of the deal. Uh, because even a small amount of what Bellator got uh, could mean a lot for MLW. But at the same time, there's also a lot of questions about uh, DAZN uh, long term. And this pandemic has not helped them. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I mean, I think a great news uh, story for MLW uh, certainly increases their exposure and I think the attachment to a big company like The Zone I I think it's really big for MLW like they they're going to be getting something for this and I think it it makes MLW that much more of a player being attached to something like The Zone yeah definitely bolsters I think their legitimacy so uh, good for court and what else do we have here? Uh, some, uh, oh, Tessa Blanchard was announced on Tuesday night that she, she hasn't been doing any of the Impact shows since the the shutdown began, but they are now advertising her for a five way match to headline Slammiversary that's going to be happening July eighteenth uh, with Michael Elgin, Eddie Edwards, Ace Austin, and Trey Miguel. So that is the tentative uh, Impact title match for Slammiversary. UFC had a bunch of news items on Tuesday, including. The mysterious Fight Island will be on Yas Island in Abu Dhabi, which is the same location where they have run uh, previous cards in Abu Dhabi. So this was not exactly as um, mythical a location as I guess they had led people to believe. But uh, they're going to be going there beginning with the UFC 251 pay-per-view that's happening July the 11th. And that's going to feature three title fights, including... Uh, Gilbert Burns challenging Kamaru Usman for the welterweight title, a rematch between Alexander Volkanovsky and Max Holloway for the featherweight title, and they're also going to be having the vacant bantamweight title decided between uh, Piotr Jan and Jose Aldo. So they're going to run July 11th, July 15th, July 18th, and July 25th. So four events in July in Abu Dhabi. No fans. No right. fans for this, yeah. And um, do you believe that this was the same island that Dana was talking about all along? I think so. I think this was... I, I don't know if there were others ever in discussion, but they have a prior relationship with Abu Dhabi, and I think he just threw out the notion of Fight Island, and it just became this ridiculous story that everyone started fantasizing about, and it's it's like it's, it's the place we've run in Abu Dhabi. There is going to be an octagon on the beach to work out, but the actual fight event, it's going to be in the same location that they've done prior events in. So. And, and any other, like, um, um, I guess, uh, news about, you know, whether or not fighters will have to stay on the on the premises or anything like that? Well, they're going to have a whole zone for the, the UFC staff and fighters. So they're going to have, it sounds like they're going to have their own, like, bubble for where, where they are. It's not going to be open to anybody to just enter or exit. It's going to be there for the UFC. Hello? Did I lose you? Yes. Oh, okay. Okay, you're still there. Sorry. Um, uh, you're just taking this all in. I mean, you're like, wow, <laughs> I can't believe this. We're going th- I don't know if you can hear outside, John, but we're going through a thunderstorm right now, so I don't know if that's going to affect our connection oh, at all. My, my, uh, my lights flickered a few minutes ago, and it must be from the storm. 
problem. So I hope we're okay. Okay. Well, well, we'll power through. We'll see. We'll see how this goes. Uh, last news item. Uh, another UFC one is that uh, for the following month in August, August 15th, it will be the long awaited trilogy fight between Stipe Miocic and Daniel Cormier. They don't have a location yet. Uh, Ariel Hawani has reported that uh, they're, they're looking at Las Vegas, Arizona, and California. And he also noted that there's a hope that they could have some kind of live gate, which I take to mean like they're not dismissing the idea they could have fans uh, for that fight. Uh, regardless, I think this is going to be a massive, massive fight in August for Miocic and Cormier, who has stated this will be his retirement fight, which I think there's a good chance it will be. I thought he said that like a couple of years back. He initially had said when he turns 40, that's it. And then he turned 40 and he wasn't done yet. He had some more money fights to make. So I, I will not, I will never say a hundred percent that this will be it for him. There's always the elusive John Jones fight to have again, but I feel more confident this could be it for Cormier, win or lose. Gotcha. All right. Is this a fight that might lure in Wei Ting for one night? I think this fight's going to be a huge way. I mean, of all the fights that I think have, you know, you mentioned thus far, um, that certainly might pique my interest a little bit more. So, sure, maybe. It's a maybe. I'm, I started to list off or, or wrote, wrote down all the events coming up now that New Japan's back, UFC's ramping up their schedule, and it's, it's starting to get daunting. July is looking insane. Yeah, I know. Uh, all the New Japan Cups, as you mentioned, uh, AEW doing Fighter Fest. I guess that's a, technically a dynamite, but still, it's you know somewhat of a bigger event. Got some GCW and a number of UFCs on Yas Island. Yas Island. Yep. Yas. I mean, I, I, I've got to say, Aaron Bronstetter, our friend, had a really good line. He said that after the crowning of the BMF champion. They need to have a women's – I'm paraphrasing. They need mm -hmm. to have a women's tournament in Abu Dhabi to crown the Yas Queen. Of course they do. Yes. On to Dynamite we move. Uh, from Daly's Place, this was a new show. They were uh, taping today and tomorrow. So they'll be covering next week's episode. And – we got no no promotion, no vignettes, no beautiful day music video. Just like that, Justin Roberts is back. Oh yeah, you're right. I mean, I mean, I, I guess I wouldn't oh. have expected the big, you know, U two comeback video for Justin Roberts. Maybe you'll get that on uh, being the elite. Perhaps the the comeback of Justin Roberts, and then they announced Chris Jericho, who came out to join. We didn't know how this was going to work. They had promoted he'd be back on commentary, and it's a four man booth. And I'm going to say, I, I love Jericho on commentary. He is so entertaining. But in a four-man booth, it was pretty much Excalibur. You've got the first hour off. Pretty much, yeah. And I think they, they all realize that. I mean, it certainly would have helped things to have everybody try to fit their stuff in. Um, you know, especially considering Jericho wasn't going to be on this entire show, we, as we would see. I definitely felt like they made the right call, just essentially leaving it to Jericho yes. and... Uh, JR, JR was in there, but like, yeah, Excalibur pretty much took a step back. Even Shivani, like, even though they had the, the, they were the team, it was, it was much more like Jim Ross and Jericho with the odd line from Shivani and Excalibur was really muted in this hour. But I, I, I think Jericho's awesome on commentary. I find him so entertaining. Um, I, I thought he was great this hour. I did too. Yeah. I think it absolutely helps that we hadn't heard him in several months. So or at least like in a month. I don't exactly know how long, but it sound, his energy sounded so incredibly refreshing. He is, of course, very up to date with all the storylines, and he's excellent at like putting focus on the participants in the ring for the matches he did call. And he just yells. like His volume is at like a different level, like everything. Mm -hmm. I love this! So we started off with the Butcher and the Blade against ftr in their first aew match and ftr they just pull up in their truck with matching gear and jackets they just look like a million bucks here and their and their truck looked like it was uh like this was a vintage truck it's a beautiful little truck yeah um i guess this is their special entrance this is their version of their undertaker motorcycle yeah they they have a pickup truck that they pull up to the side of daily's place i don't know if you can do this at every arena but for Daly's place, I guess it works. They've got the truck. Cody's got his. Uh, what what does he have? Nissan. Oh, yeah, his... <laughs> what was yeah, it? He's no, got... he's got a truck too. He's got like a F one fifty. 
Yeah, that that's what he had. Um, well, so, somebody had a really nice car, and it didn't make it to the end of the night after Moxley and Brian Cage. No. Uh, they showed Tully Blanchard, Arn Anderson, Sean Spears, Lance Archer, and Jake Roberts spread out in the seats, and it appeared like Blanchard and Arn were, were scouting. Yes, really interesting how they might play into FTR's future, um, considering, I guess, the finish of this match. Yeah. Uh, Ross is ecstatic. They're using the tag rope, and Jericho just says, it's like it's your birthday, Jim. They're they're doing tag wrestling properly. And uh, so Dax takes this uh, this shoulder block, and he's just playing possum. Or sorry, this was Wheeler, I think, that did it. And Wheeler is um, the former da- Dash. Dash Wilder. Yes. Yeah. Jericho's putting over the butcher. He says, they call him butcher for a reason. He cuts meat. And he says, we need more matches like this. I can do this kind of thing. Ross compared Wilder to Buzz Sawyer. And then we get uh, Dax Harwood coming in, hitting a dragon screw and a brain buster. And then they do the power and glory spot, which is the superplex and then Cash hit uh, more so an elbow drop than the splash. And they hit the Goodnight Express, that is the renamed Shatter Machine. And then the Mind Breaker, which was a Spike Pile Driver, pinning Blade in 10 minutes and 20 seconds. Well, the Spike Pile Driver, of course, being the finisher of the Brain Busters, which was the team featuring yes. Kelly and Arn. That they so, were bringing up here, yes. So that was really interesting. And I, I mean, I thought this was a good match. To be honest with you, it wasn't too different from your usual revival match. And I never really expected it to be different because these guys, we know how good they are. The difference, I think, in AEW and why it feels so refreshed is that you can trust the storytelling to match their in-ring level in a company like this. So um, I love that they're keeping up the, you know, doing the whole tributes to the old tag teams thing. They even threw in, I would say, maybe a little tribute to Randy Orton here with the draping DDT. And, um, you know, the specific call out here in the finish to Tully and Arn with that spike pile driver, uh, as they're both watching the match, I, I, I'm really curious to know what, how they all tie in into the future. I thought it was a good little tag match. It was like a great introduction of FTR doing their stuff. Like just, just a solid 10 minute television match. I, I enjoyed it a lot. Shivani got into the ring with them and Dax was saying, this is the pinnacle of pro wrestling and tag wrestling. And then the young bucks come out congratulate them on the match and Matt thanks them for helping them out two weeks ago, but you failed to properly introduce yourselves. And they say, we're the young bucks. We've been carrying tag wrestling solely on our backs for 15 years. And we're the best team in AEW before putting out their hand. And before we can see what happens, butcher and the blade jump the young bucks and then FTR jump in to help them. Sabian and Havoc run in, Omega and Page run in, and then we get the heel tag teams on the floor, and FTR is left with Omega and Page and the Bucks as they're exchanging words. Good segment, you know, simple little scuffle, and we've seen, like, this is, this is, like, I I would say it's kind of become a pretty standard part of AEW booking, get everybody out there in the ring, and I, I think what I don't realize is that why do I like this more than maybe what I see on the other show where they do similar things? You know, people argue, they all come out. I think what I prefer about this is that rather than getting the match right in the next segment, we have a whole week to anticipate whatever combination of match is to follow here. Cause on raw, like these guys would all come out and then we would dip the black and we'd fade back up and all of a sudden it'd be an eight man tag. Eight man. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean the big match, I mean, that's not happening next week. They're going to make you wait for FTR and the Bucks. I mean, part of me hopes they wait beyond fighter fest, but I could also see them not waiting past fighter fest. Yeah. But we'll see where, where things go. Uh, Dasha is with the natural nightmares, which is quite the growing unit here. Uh, we have Dustin and QT Marshall. And next week, they're receiving an AEW tag title match. I don't know why, but they are. Brandy asks why Allie is wearing her family's jacket. And QT has made Allie an American Nightmare family jacket. And QT explains she's part of the family. And Dustin tells QT how important this match is next week. I need your head in the game. And your partner, or Allie, will not be ringside next week. This has been a story that's been bubbling on dark. Um, and, you know, uh, 
Davey Portman does great reports at postwrestling.com of AEW Dark uh, and Impact as well. But yes. unfortunately, not everybody will have a chance to read it in time for these shows. So, I mean, I would really love if they did some sort of recap. And I don't know why they don't, you know, just talk, catch catching. And they're up. doing like they don't do big storyline stuff, but they do some storyline like they like that. Alan Angels is now five. And I mean, they, they do. Yeah, like you tune in and it's like they are progressing storyline stuff as well on that show. And the, the QT Alley stuff, that's been the major focus for, for Dark that they've been pushing this story. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, just a little segment. Hey, here's what you missed on Dark on YouTube. Go and check it out. Did you know that John Moxley had this like really long match on the show? I don't know if anybody would know. So I, I, I still don't really understand why they refuse to, you know, just cut a little highlight pack. Hikaru Shida and Chris Statlander versus Nyla Rose and Penelope Ford. Kip Sabian came out with Ford. Uh, Ford and Rose jumped them. And then Shida gets sent to the floor. And it's Jericho throwing to commercial and asking JR how he did. And we see uh, Britt Baker in the Rolls Royce. And Jericho points out that she's with Reba. And the announcers correct him and say, Rebel. And it was like, no, they you're, they missed a joke here. Jericho was on point here. Yeah, I mean the but the joke is her she prefer she prefers to be called Rebel. It's it's that Britt Baker mistakenly calls her Reba. Yeah, I just got from their reaction. It sounded like it was like a, a real correction, but I could be wrong. Uh, they, there was a knee lift spot, and this led to them discussing Mister Wrestling Two and the million dollar knee lift. That was his his famous move. Uh, Ford did the Matrix into a stunner on Statlander, and then a flying knee is hit by Sheeta onto Ford. Um, this is when the, the, this match got got really good at a point. Uh, Rose draped both women on the top rope and came off with a flying knee to both Sheeta and Statlander, and then Statlander stops the springboard by Ford, allowing Sheeta to recover. And a knee sends Rose to the floor, hits a Falcon Arrow, but Ford kicks out. Sabian then trips up Sheeta, and Statlander hits a dive onto Sabian, and Ford grabs a belt from Rose, hits Sheeta, and uses the Fisherman Suplex to pin the champion in ten minutes. And two seconds. I'm not wild about the belt shot finish, but I thought that these four had a, a very good tag match. I thought so too. You know, I I think AEW's women's division really continues to uh, build and build and develop, and and primarily it's uh, up and coming names like uh, Penelope Ford, who have I think really I don't know stepped up lately and, and really filled out this division, and it looks like she is getting the next shot. Yeah, I mean, they, they really were hinting at a Sheeta rose rematch next week, but definitely they've inserted Ford into the picture either ahead of Rose or in addition to. But um, yeah, I, I thought these women had a really good tag match. This was one of the, the better women's matches uh, of late in AEW, so I, I thought they did a really good good job here. Darby Allen has still not been cleared to wrestle, so he's out hanging out with Tony Hawk in black and white, uh, and he's... He's practicing going down a ladder on his skateboard onto a ramp and continually screwing up until he finally lands it at the end. This is like um uh this is like that scene in Kill Bill where she's stuck in the casket and we've got to go back of how she learns like the punch that will break the casket and the whole backstory of him being able to learn this uh, this skateboard move because it was at uh, it was at double or nothing when he comes off the ladder with the skateboard that caused this injury to him and he's perfecting how to come off the ladder properly with the skateboard he is going and learning from the master himself so that he can <laughs> bring this technique with him into a wrestling ring next time with a ladder skateboard spot I, I used to follow a bit of skateboarding I don't know if I've ever seen Tony Hawk uh, do this specifically uh just jumping off a ladder with with a skateboard i mean i'm sure he it's possible but uh i didn't even think about that backstory the fact that he he is now perhaps doing the thing that you know uh he wasn't able to do in the in the match although i don't know if he was actually trying to land the move during the match because there's a body underneath that uh skateboard it it, it all ties in together somehow uh yeah (laughs) This is the most unique guy in wrestling, Darby he, Allen. He, he, it, it's super strange, um, but I mean, something like this, I actually really enjoyed. It was some really cool celebrity integration here 
Tony Hawk, good little personality piece that tells you something about his personality. He's fucking crazy. There's nothing I want more this year than a serious sit-down interview with Darby Allen being interviewed by Jim Ross. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as we've seen, that could be good or bad. You know, I, I didn't really enjoy, like, what they did with Tony Schiavone in that short little instance. But a sit-down with, with Jim Ross, I think that could be good. Yeah. I think it'd be either fantastic or it would be just amazing sure. in, in different ways. Yeah. I mean, it would just be Jim Ross trying to communicate to I, Darby Allen. I think a skateboarding lesson between Darby Allen and Jim <laughs> Ross. That's what I want to see. Ride along with those two. Ooh. We had another Britt Baker recovery video. This one was kind of weak. It was just her explaining being a role model is exhausting. Uh, she talks about the bad attitude that Big Swole has. Meanwhile, she has her own struggles, such as a microbiology exam she couldn't study for but still aced. This was uh, definitely more of a typical you know, build-up video this week. It was fine, but um, yeah, certainly maybe you know if your expectations are, are for something – of the standard that we've seen from her previously, you might have been disappointed, but it wasn't bad. Yeah, um, kind of, kind of forgettable. Yeah. Did you like look any deeper into this, like, like I did? You know, like, okay, uh, without getting like too political, like you know, on on the podcast, like we had Big Soul here complain about something very legitimate, and then you had Britt Baker basically kind of like talking about her own far more minor struggles. I I think. I definitely had the same thought that I feel the intention was probably big swole complaining about, you know, her, you know, be, being, being gone for, for a long time or her placement in AEW. Maybe that was the intent, but in this, in this climate, I think it was impossible not to make it come across as something racial. Yeah. I wonder, I wonder. And I mean, if, if that was the intent, I thought they kind of skirted around it nicely without maybe you know like being too confrontational uh but yeah it just it, it made me wonder uh jake hager santana and ortiz versus best friends and orange cassidy uh the inner circle come out and they pose with their middle fingers and as hager goes after orange cassidy jericho describes it as hager beating up the 15 year old version of himself as cassidy gets laid out on the stage uh qt is with ali in the crowd and Hager hits a Vader bomb, which Jericho dubs the Hager bomb. Not a Jager bomb, but a Hager bomb. I like it. Yeah. So uh, they go to a commercial. We get the picture in picture. And Ortiz takes Cassidy's glasses and throws them away. Cassidy gets tagged for his big spot, entering with Hager, does the limp kicks, then runs. And Hager misses him, flying to the floor. He does a double Hurricane Rana to Santana on Ortiz. Dives onto Hager and then a tornado DDT on Santana. It was quite the series of spots here with Cassidy. And then Santana gets shoved off the top and it allows Cassidy to take Ortiz and cradle him, tying up the leg and pinning him in 10 minutes and 11 seconds. I thought this was a really fun match and I specifically really liked the way they treated Orange Cassidy here. I feel like, you know, in, in recent appearances, especially during these empty arena shows, I feel like the gimmick has kind of been a little confused. Like we don't exactly know when he's supposed to be lazy and when it is he actually gets good. Sometimes it's just a combination of everything. And I think the point kind of gets lost by the end of the match here. He like pretty much was knocked out for the beginning and only came in for that hot tag where he did a bit of the lazy stuff and then really turned on and was just good for the rest of the match. And I thought it made complete sense. I thought the crowd's energy also really helped those spots this week. And the booking here totally made sense. Make it made him look strong, sets him up for Jericho. Yeah, so this was to set up the big angle afterward where Jericho storms the ring and he's got the bat and he attacks Trent in the ribs, levels Orange Cassidy, and he goes under the ring <laughs> to pull out what Tony Schiavone describes has to be 20 pounds of blood oranges. Oh, no. What does this mean? Not just any oranges. Blood oranges. Yeah. And Jericho proceeds to beat Orange Cassidy with the oranges. And after the bat shot. Like like a sack of oranges. A sack of oranges, yes. And Cassidy is bloodied. Jericho says, blood orange Cassidy has been juiced. To which I said, no, 
as the show title describes, he was beaten to a bloody pulp. Oh, wonderful. Very nice. Um, I guess they had a <laughs> they had Orange is Cassidy Blade just to make this pun, didn't they? <laughs> I listen. Maybe maybe this is the angle that was required for an Orange Cassidy grudge match, but this was one of the silliest attacks I have ever seen in a pro wrestling context. Not okay. the silliest, but it's up there. Well, I mean, yes, but uh, I think in a weird way, it's like almost apropos of an Orange Cassidy feud. That here, this man has been beaten down by. By vitamin C. By a sack of oranges. I mean, yes, it, it was silly, but at the same time, you saw the weight of this bag of oranges. It really did not look soft. Like, I might rather take, like, a worked barbed wire bat than, like, this really heavy sack of oranges, which looked like they had no I don't, I don't know about that. <laughs> oh, come on. Like, a worked bat, I mean. Like, you know, a debarbed barbed wire bat. Okay? But, like, these... Orange skin can be really thick, John. These aren't tomatoes here. Okay? This thing looked really heavy. Um, but it was ridiculous. But I thought it was like this. It felt serious. And I think maybe you did need the blood, you know, to really make it serious. Because you certainly risk something like, you know, um, like Mitch the Potted Plant, you know, where it could have been treated as comedy. And certainly I think people will look at it. We're talking about this. It was absolutely a ridiculous scene. But Orange Cassidy is a ridiculous character. You need something, I think, different and creative here to get people talking about the feud. Um, I really enjoyed it. I, I think it sets up the, the match really well. And I think people have like, it's a match people want to see with Jericho and Orange Cassidy. So uh, that seems to be the fighter fest direction. It's, it's, I think the perfect level of a match that is maybe a little too silly for a Chris Jericho match on a, on an actual pay-per-view, but for like a semi pay-per-view, like, you know, more of a TV special, I think it's absolutely perfect. And to see them like give a good amount of build to it, Really, it's a place that allows Chris Jericho's creativity to shine with with this type of character. And I do recommend everybody check out the uh, podcast that he released today talking about uh, the creation of the um, uh, Stadium Stampede with the Inner Circle. Yeah, it's a really great discussion about the formation of the group, the original ideas that they had, like Phoenix and Pentagon being the team instead of Santana and Ortiz. Um a lot on the Mike Tyson angle as well. And Jericho just does not mince words about the gooch and th th this, this idiot getting in the way of everything and some hilarious stuff about Vitor Belfort. Um, no, it's, it, and all the stadium stampede stuff. It's a, it's a really great discussion about pretty much all the inner circle stuff that they have done up to and including double or nothing. Mm -hmm. Tony's with Billy and Austin Gunn, and they immediately get interrupted by MJF, who tells Tony to be a good mic stand. He's been undefeated for over a year, has the ring, has been ranked number one for three weeks, and yet Jungle Boy got a TNT title shot before him, citing the favoritism in this company. He says, everyone in that locker room has a ceiling, and I'm that ceiling. I'm a great white shark swimming in a sea of minnows. Copyright Michael Cole, WrestleMania 31. Is that right? Well, that was that was the line was that he was a he was a big fish in a sea of minnows, referring to Sting. It was not a oh, and right. MJF is making it a compliment of being the great white shark swimming in a sea of minnows. Gotcha. Yes. So Billy interrupts saying, I'm the great white. And MJF He was in calls, that match. Yeah, he was. You're right. As was a... Uh, uh is anyone else on this show that was involved in that? Don't I mean, I mean, so. the one who uh, talked about the commentary was Art Anderson, who was like right there in the in the back. So yeah. I mean, by default, uh, he calls Austin Gunn a talentless scumbag, and Billy's just trying to get him a job. Billy says you made a mistake, and this is going to set up Billy Gunn versus MJF next week. Mm hmm. Yeah. Was the other kid there his his other son? Do you recognize him? The other kid in the gun club shirt? Oh, I didn't even notice the other oh. kid. It was like another person. Anyway. But, um, you know, for a TV one-off match as like almost like a temporary thing for MJF, throw in Billy Gunn. Why not? Um, We'll see what he does. I think MJF could have a great promo before that match sometime over the next week. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Hello, ass man. <laughs> Can I call you ass man or asshole? <laughs> 
Tony, uh, uh, sorry, after this, uh, Jericho never returns to commentary after the angle. So he was just there for the first hour. They recap Colt Cabana being pursued by the Dark Order after his losses in the Battle Royal and to Chris Jericho last week. And that takes us to Cabana versus Sammy Guevara. And they point out that Cabana is 40 and his confidence is starting to wane. Uh, and he's taking on the 26-year-old Sammy Guevara. Uh, there's a dive by Sammy and we go through the break. Guevara gets bent over from an elbow strike that he takes uh, tremendously. He's hit with the bionic elbow, the flying apple, but then Cabana goes to the moonsault and only gets a two count. And as he sets up for a, uh, an inverted Chicago skyline, Cabana slips on the rope, allowing Guevara to capitalize, hit the GTS, and win in 726. And the slump continues for Colt Cabana. I believe it was the GTH. Uh, sorry, the GTH. The GTH. What? what does the H stand for? Go hell? to hell. Go to go to hell. Go to Houston. Uh, Houston. Hamilton. <laughs> the go to Hamilton. Good little match. Um, you know, further is Colt's story, and and Sammy is definitely um in a position, I guess, where he needs a win. So, yeah, sure. Sent them to Hamilton. Evil Uno and Stu Grayson come out. They're back. Yes. Yes, you're right. I didn't even realize that. A lot yeah. of returns this week. Yeah, it, it seems that um, I guess there's some um, ability now for Canadian because we, we had uh, Ethan Page and Josh Alexander on the the most recent Impact tapings. So it seems that whatever restrictions there were, those have been at least softened. Although um, now we just need yeah. the Brits. Yeah, well, we'll see if if others uh, follow suit. But anyway, they were back here, um, followed by John Silver, Alex Reynolds, and then Brody Lee, who. Per- who lifts up Colt to his feet, and Ross asks if that's a metaphor for Brody getting Cabana back on his feet, as Cabana then walks to the back and leaves through the heel tunnel, where the darkness goes. The heel tunnel, did not even realize that. Yeah. So, so you know, are there any ambiguous, like, FTR, I guess we don't exactly know whether they're heels or baby faces. Because they're feuding pretty much with everybody, but they yeah we need we need camera angles of how these guys exit right. so that we can know yeah maybe they got back in the car and just drove out yeah yeah they're just um, backed out I mean yeah Guevara gets on the mic and calls Cabana a big fat loser when his music is playing but then they stop it to play Matt Hardy so that felt like a screw up <laughs> Matt comes out and says he respects him. Sammy reminds him of a young Matt Hardy with a never-say-die mentality. You're the future of AEW, but to realize your full potential, you need to get away from Chris Jericho. And Sammy's like, dude, did you listen to the podcast today? This guy has helped make me. He then Matt then shifts into version one Matt Hardy with the uh, Matt Tur of Facts, then turns into Damascus and says he's going to mash him into a Monfongo and eat him before chanting delete. And Jim Ross capped this perfectly by saying, I hope our fans enjoy the Twilight Zone. I I thought the in live and in living color, the shift from character to character, I, I did not like. I didn't like it either. I, I think we've seen him make it work in previous uh, episodes because it's been... In the middle of a match, he's like, you know, come up with creative things like uh, being dropped into an ice box or a lake of incarnation or just at the very least getting off camera and then coming back on. This was simply him <laughs> looking down, going <laughs> and then resurfacing as one of these other gimmicks. And it's it, like ba- it was like watching a bad improv set. Well, I could only imagine what a new viewer just flipping on TNT for the first time who might not be familiar at all with any of Matt Hardy's prior characters, what they would think of this. I mean, it was it's a pretty ridiculous thing in general, but I, I definitely felt feel like it needs a bit of treatment in order to not, not come across looking like pretty lame. Yeah, I, I think that what this character is kind of missing is that so much of it, it's the focus on the past and not... What is this character now? Like, what is the what is the genesis of this character that AEW represents? And I think there's a place for the Damascus character and for you know the that that side of things. But see, see I actually feel like that is a new thing that AEW is doing that he certainly wasn't doing in WWE or even like the, the like other than like him you know doing the Lake of Incarnation thing, reincarnation thing, 
Like we don't see him be able to like he's not able to shift sort of on command or at least in the in the middle of a match. That is something new that we're seeing in AEW. But, you know, maybe what you're suggesting is what's the next character that we're going to get from Matt Hardy? Yeah, I'm just, I'm just not into this the shifting of the characters. I just don't find that they're they're doing much. It's just I love it like in the middle of a match. It's so great in the middle of a match. Well, they're obviously doing uh, something with Matt and Guevara, which we'll get back to later. Then they aired this this Joey Janela video, and this was, this was shot very very well. He's at a bar and he's just drinking and kind of wallowing in his current state. That he came to AEW to become a star. What happened? He was in the main event a year ago with John Moxley at Fighter Fest, and now he's faded into the darkness. And he feels like the best moments are behind him as the background features the famous clip uh, with, with Zandig where he's, he's coming off the, the building into the truck from a tournament of survival, uh, which is a nice little touch there. And he's lost his direction. And he's out in the street when he runs into Sonny Kiss who pulls up in a car and gives him a ride and it leaves with uh, the words to be continued. Finally, Sonny Kiss is getting a storyline on Dynamite. Like this is almost it almost feels like it's a call up. Um it's a it's a long time coming. You know, Janela himself is somebody who really hasn't had any sort of storyline at all in, in many months. If it, like I can't even remember his last actual story. Can you? Um no, but I I'm trying to put this all together. Maybe um maybe the clue is that they showed the Zandig clip in Philadelphia and the message at the end was it's always sunny in Philadelphia. Ooh. Maybe that he has to go reclaim that past glory and the bridge for his past to become his future is sunny kiss. You mean he's got to jump off that damn roof again? Might have to do it again. I, I hope he doesn't for his own safety. That was not, uh, that was not good for him physically, but for a, a viral clip that really put his name on the map, that was the clip in, 2016 this is certainly an interesting pairing of like you know vastly different personalities but knowing i think janela's creativity and seeing how well produced this was i i do have high hopes for for what's to come with these two i i like this i thought it was like it was a different style of video and i'm I'm curious to see where it goes for for mm -hmm. two characters that i think people are engaged in but have not been featured players yeah Dasha tries to get a word with Cabana. He doesn't want to speak. And then he knocks on Brody Lee's door and enters. So this guy is just going into, uh, whether it be tunnels or doors, he is going into the darkness. Tunnels, doors. Um, yeah, they, they've got, they've got their own room. So I, what do you think of this cold storyline? Um, I don't know. We're, we'll see where it progresses. I don't really have a, an opinion yet on it, what they're doing with them. It certainly can't be a retread of what they already did with Chris Daniels, where it's like sort of like a fake out. Ha, ah, I'm not turning. Like, Colt has to turn. Come on. Again, I, I need to see either a heel, dark Colt Cabana, or I need to see Colt Cabana infect the Dark Order with, oh. his, with his happy personality. <laughs> That's it. The, the Light Order. The Light Order, exactly. The Light Hearted Order. Well, that, that could be one one direction. Next week, we've got MJF, Billy Gunn, Omega and Hangman Page against QT and Dustin Rhodes, a TNT title match, and then Jericho and Guevara, the sex gods, versus the best friends, and the best friends will put their tag title shot on the line for Fighter Fest against Jericho and Guevara. Could you see... Uh, I, I do not see it happening, uh, because I think you've got Jericho and Orange Cassidy, but... With it being two weeks, nice. yeah. you could you could do this where Jericho and Guevara get the tag title shot and you do Jericho Cassidy. Yeah, I, so, uh, so I mean, maybe they will do it. It's absolutely, I think, a bigger matchup with, you know, the sex gods versus... By the way, should it be L-E-S if it's a plural? Or is it just the? Uh, God, I, I used to know this shit inside <laughs> out when I, t when I did French, like the proper everything on it. Like if it French, ends with... French speakers, please let us know. Should it be L-E-S, Les Sex Gods? Anyway, um, I, I definitely can see them doing it. But at the same time, I feel like this is just like 
another misdirection from AEW, and I think a really smart one because you can see possibility in either way, either one coming true. But I think this will be a really strong win for the best friends as they lead towards their title match because they have to throw them a bone. It would make the best friends look terrible if they lost the shot. Yeah, I mean, they, they've done so much to build up this this title shot. Uh, I do see them sticking with it. Uh, and then we're also going to get the Young Bucks against Jimmy Havoc and Kip Sabian. So Matt Jackson's first match since uh, the Stampede or the, uh, yeah, the stadium Stampede. Next two, Out. right? Uh, next two as well, right. Marvez catches up with John Moxley outside. He's in a bad mood. He's sick of Taz running his mouth saying Cage is going to beat him at Fighter Fest. You're under my skin. I'm going to pop Cage's head like a pimple. And I'm a miserable son of a bitch. And that's what separates me from the pack. And anyone that thinks they can beat me, that's what pisses me off. So Taz comes out of his trailer, tells him to get yourself right. Get your head right. And then Cage jumps him from behind throws him into a garbage can, and they fight by this car where Moxley grabs a pipe, misses Cage, and shatters the window, and then Moxley gets slammed onto the hood and then onto the back windshield as Moxley is left screaming in pain, and we never get an update. The man is just left there as Excalibur is calling for help. Looked like a pretty brutal attack, honestly, and I thought it, it, the, the physicality looked really good. You know, satisfying cracks in the windshield of this car, I'm um, sure, you know, a, a spine buster onto the hood of this car that probably didn't feel very good. And by the end of it, though, you had Brian Cage, again, had the advantage and looking really strong. It, you know, I think they're doing everything right with this. The promos are are, are pretty strong, too. But I, I do worry that it's not go- it's going to be another pay-per-view where this really does not feel like it's the hottest match going into the show. Do, do, what do you think? Not yet. Um yeah, it, it it I think it feels like a match that will be good. Uh I think that we need probably like a really big promo from Taz and I'm really curious to see cuz you know it's it's you can look like they're very it's like this makeshift pairing with Taz and Cage much like we've seen with like Lashley and MVP over the past month where you've got to build up a challenger in 4 weeks and it's kind of can kind of contrast like both Brody of them. Lee even, like a, a month ago, you know? Yeah, but in this one, you didn't have really a mouthpiece for Brody Lee that, right. you know, Cage has with, with Taz. But that's essentially what they're doing. I'm interested to see the match. I think the promos have been fine. But, yeah, it hasn't really hit that feeling like this is a, this is a major title match. Yeah, yeah. And I, I really don't wonder, like, what, what it is that, that's kind of missing from perhaps this, like, Moxley run. Um, like he's great, but he his presence just has not felt as big on this show as maybe some of the other personalities. I just thought after watching this segment that I feel they should have scrapped one of the prior scenes that we just saw, and instead we see a despondent wrestler walking out to his rental and then sees this car shattered, and there's <laughs> Colt Cabana just saying, God. And then the Dark Order pulls up in like their limo and opens the door <laughs> to give Colt a ride. And that's how we see Colt. That's our final scene of Colt on this show. Oh, that's brilliant. He's, <laughs> he's just, he's Gil from The Simpsons. <laughs> so they aired some comments of Cody teeing up the match with Mark Quinn saying the criticism he gets from people is his bell to bell. And that's what this TNT title reign is going to dispel. He recaps last week's win over Jungle Boy and then talks about uh, Quen as an opponent. So that's our main event uh, for the TNT title. Matt Hardy came out in 2020 wearing tie-dye with Private Party. So this was um, like 2000 Hardy? This was dad. We're fine. Leave us alone, Matt Hardy. (laughs) Dad, we're fine. Leave us alone. What do you mean? This guy felt like, uh, I don't know. Hey, guys, isn't this the cool stuff to wear? (laughs) He looked ridiculous here with this shirt. I mean, this was what he was wearing, like... Against uh, Eddie Guerrero in 2001. Yeah. yeah, Who was he facing in that match? X-Pac. Like that era. Like, like, you know... um... Except he's 20, 19 years older. But, But he's somebody who can, you know, change vessels. I don't know. He can't change the calendar. It's still 2020, and he was wearing tie-dye on this shirt, uh, on this show. Matt and Isaiah Cassidy go to the back, 
And Quinn, early on in this match, is selling the left leg from two weeks ago. And we go through the commercial. This kind of drove me nuts. It was like my biggest criticism of when you're selling your body part and every single offensive maneuver of Mark Quinn was, how can I fuck up my leg worse? I know. I can dive countless times to the floor and land on my leg, which the announcers pointed out each time <laughs> he's not doing his leg any favors. He would, uh, he did this cool uh, twisting DDT after landing on his feet from a vertical suplex, and then he's literally limping to set up for a Topecon hero and then can't put any weight on his leg, gets back into the ring, then he hits a Fosbury flop to the floor. Cody rolls onto the stage, so Mark Quinn hobbles up to the top, hits a 450 splash onto the stage, and then inside the ring, Cody catches him with an ankle lock, goes down to his back, and then uses his foot to torque the leg and force Quinn to submit at 11 minutes and 43 seconds. I, you know, I thought it was an entertaining match throughout, but I had some of the same problems as you did, where, I mean, unfortunately, they were kind of caught in a in a in a strange situation here where number one you had the like this was a, Mark Quinn by far his you know the biggest match he's had in AEW uh in a main event spot on dynamite in a singles capacity so you you know these matches are supposed to be in many ways showcases for the for the opponents that Cody is going to face and so he had to pull out his best stuff at the same time i guess given the existing injury that led to this match and also perhaps just you know as a way to um you make the match a bit more engaging. You needed the guy to sell the body part, but the body part just happens to be the one that he uses for every single move he has in his offense. So didn't he just say last week in that segment with Matt Hardy and Isaiah Cassie, it's like, Oh, my leg's fine. It's fine. Well, I mean, it started off fine, but then I guess, you know, it wasn't fine. Wear, wear and tear. Yeah. You think you're okay, but you're not. And that's perfectly fine. But I felt, felt, I feel like he could have like done most of this match, you know, with like injury free. But the moment you start selling it, and especially towards the end of the match, you better start failing some of those moves. Like you better show it, start showing me that you can't do a number of these moves because he's certainly like throughout this match holding his leg, but he's flawlessly performing every single move that he was attempting here. There was one springboard that he did slip. Uh, doing the the springboard, but the rest he was hitting. And to me, it's to me, I wouldn't be doing like five of these dives. To me, it's like if the story of the match is okay, this guy's got the biggest opportunity of his life, so he's going to build up for one big dive that it's do or die because it's his biggest offense. But if he crashes and burns, that's it. And instead, he was like getting up from these and just continuously doing them. And it's not like that was the story on commentary. It was just. I, I was kind of just taken out of this. It's like, I, I don't have sympathy for this guy. It's like his legs all messed up, but yet he's just, he's just constant, nonstop, like flying spots to the floor. And it just, it just was uh, a notch below for me. What way below last week's match with jungle boy. I do agree. Unfortunately, you know, the, the, the flying offense like looked great, but if you're going to, you kind of have to choose either showcasing your flying offense or telling your ankle story. And you can't really mix the two, I think, as, as as much as they tried to do here. But, you know... Like, if he built up to one big sp dive and gets Cody in and that's your big near-fall spot, like, that would have been the big moment to to build up to. But the, the cost of that is your leg is totally screwed now. That's a fine story to tell, that he it was worth the risk because this title's on the line, but he's only got, like, one in him because you've got to sell the effects of what this high-risk maneuver is going to backfire on you. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. I, I think in the weeks to come, um, it'll be interesting to see if, like, Cody might sort of settle on a certain style for these types of matches because, like, that the psychology type of match, you know, is certainly Cody's forte. Um, at the same time, like, every new opponent he's going to face, he's going to want to allow them to showcase their best stuff. So, you know, do you run into more situations like this where you kind of try to blend the two and maybe, you know, according to at least both of our opinions, maybe um, not doing as well? I just think you have to, I mean, you just, for, for this one, I, I could see a match that this, this works with, with the injury, with the opponent. Uh, I, I just think it took, it just be a see, different. Last, last week's match with Jungle Boy, I think was like similar in some ways like he's cody going up against a high flyer who had to basically sell for most of the match until he was making his big comebacks um but 
Yeah, I don't know. I, we'll see. Cody helped up Quinn at the end, and then Jake Hager comes out to confront Cody, but instead grabs Arn and then takes Cody and tosses him across the ring. This prompts Private Party and Matt Hardy to come out, and they use chair shots to attack Hager, but he won't go off his feet. He gets clotheslined to the floor, kind of stumbles, but stays on his feet. And then out comes Santana and Ortiz and Guevara. So it's four on four. The referees run out to try and separate them. Matt hits the twist of bait on Guevara, and they clear the ring of the inner circle. And Cody gets on the mic saying if Hager wants a TNT title shot at Fighter Fest, then it's on. So I thought they were setting this up for next week, but instead that's going to be Fighter Fest, and we don't know who the opponent will be next week. Sort of the problem with like the these, you know, having a, a title match every week, but also having like kind of like a big event to to promote in the future is it, it, it certainly will like diminish the perhaps um you know outcome of any of these TNT title matches that are set to take place next week. So um yeah. Uh I, I don't know. We'll see. But Hager Cody I think is a fine match for that pay per view. And before that you'll probably get a number of other matches. What did you think of Dynamite overall? I thought it was all right. Yeah. Um, decent show. Maybe nothing that was like a spectacular segment, like maybe in some previous weeks, but decent. I'd go like a six on this show. I think it was kind of a uh, below par. I, I think the first hour, I, I like the first hour a lot with FTR, with Jericho on commentary, the attack on Orange Cassidy. Um, that that to me and, and that women's tag match. I thought the first hour was was very good. Uh, second second hour less so. Well, let's see what the forum thought. Forum dot out of ten. What did you guys think of AEW Dynamite? Eight point four eight. Wow, wow. they've spoken. Yeah. They're riding a wave. Yeah, we're we're be- we're we're below the listeners on this one. I think most weeks we are, to be honest. With AEW, at least. AEW is very consistent with our ratings here on the forum. It's usually always in the 8 to 9 range. Mm-hmm. All right. Why don't you kick things off? We got an MJ who starts us off and says, So, this will come as no surprise, but I am a big fan of what AEW is doing. Where I previously thought they have too many random pieces, it seems they find something for all of them to do. Even Sonny Kiss and QT Marshall. Dynamite in general reminds me of an era in wrestling where every segment felt like it gave the future talent something to do. Direction and storylines progressed. I look at what AEW does and we have feuds up and down the card. It's not that hard. Even a small segment like MJF and Billy Gunn sets up a reason for a match. Mid-card or even lower acts don't feel like cast-offs because they have progressing stories. You may not like all the stories, like Colt and the Dark Order, but AEW is trying to keep their show to a proven formula. For example... It's fun for me watching, knowing that eventually Brody Lee and Cabana will have a match, but getting to follow the logic on how they get there. Have you been keeping up with BTE? I've been intrigued by the chances they have taken with it, notably giving Private Party a segment each week to film their own set of match feature, a bootleg boogeyman, and a bear. I was undecided if I enjoyed it until this past week's episode where they filmed a $12 ladder match, and all the pieces from over the week seemed to play in their movie. It was fun. Curious to your thoughts if you've seen it. I have not seen it. John, have you? No, I, I haven't either. I haven't uh, watched it lately. So uh, maybe we'll follow up with you later on, MJ, about that. Last AEW item for me, he says the Jericho podcast featured all the members of the Inner Circle, and it was a fun chat that made me realize how much these guys spend coming up with things. Yeah, it's a really good show if you uh, go out of your way to to listen to it. Paul from New Jersey, I've been facing unexpected challenges my whole life, an unexpected microbiology exam that I didn't study for. Aced it. Britt Baker's character speaks to me. Absolute gold. Sean Spears left WWE over creative differences. How ironic, as he sits in the crowd playing with his glove. Happy for Penelope Ford. She's been improving. Probably won't win the championship, but a good challenger for the time being. A 7 out of 10 show. Ari from Montreal. Great show. I loved FTR's debut match and where a lot of these stories are going. Question, who will be the one to beat Cody down the line? Maybe MJF? Or will it be Archer? Uh, I I don't really like it being MJF. I think he's got the win over Cody. I think he's got enough just from that alone. Um, that I, I really hope it's someone that is less... Uh, like, I hope this is a really long reign, and the person to end it is someone um, 
at a lower level that, you know, whether it's the big win for Darby Allen, whether it's a jungle boy down the road, whether it's, um, you know, so, someone at that level that will really be elevated by winning this title. And, and it should be a really long reign that Cody has. Yeah. I think that, I think, you know, if he should, if he will lose the belt, I think it has to come quite a while, a ways away. The goal right now is to establish that belt and to make sure that they can make it as prestigious as possible. And I think in their minds, they want to make it so that you, it might even be interchangeable someday with like the AEW championship, similar to how, you know, New Japan might be able to promote their uh, IC title, title as, you know, something that can headline a show very easily. So I think that's quite a ways away. And, it, and if it is somebody who will win it, 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 it better be somebody who they are serious about making the main eventer. Andrew from Cape Breton. Pretty good show tonight. A few wrestlers on the roster that I've seen did a good job tonight, particularly Chris Statlander and Mark Quinn. They've had a couple of stinkers recently, and it was good to see them step up and perform well. I like the TNT title matches being the new TV title for the show, and it seems Cody is using this platform to have good matches with a bunch of different people. The highlight of the night, though, was FTR with Butcher and the Blade. Matt Hardy, when he dresses up like his 1999 self, reminds me of when Michael Hayes tried to dress up like the Hardys back in the same year. That's, that's, that is exactly where Matt Hardy is at right now. He is the Mike, he is the Michael Hayes joining the Hardy Boys in 1999. God, I wonder how old was Michael Hayes? 19, uh, well, really, it'd be 20 years ago at this point. The guy is okay. He was he was 41 wow. in 1999. Okay, so he was actually younger than Matt Hardy is by four years. That's incredible. Wow. That's 45 now. Damn. I mean, that so, makes me feel old. I'm almost Michael a, Hayes' age from when he was in the Hardy Boys. Yeah, you you would not suspect Michael Hayes was only 41 in 1999, but uh, man's lived a, a hard life. Um, goes on to say, at least Hardy is in much better shape. It was a pretty ordinary episode of Dynamite, but those are always good. Seven out of ten. Kenny, I love the show tonight. My memory isn't great, but I think the women's tag was the best match, the best women's match I've seen on Dynamite. Wait, is this, Ome- th- is this Omega? <laughs> could be. Could be Kenny Omega. Kenny <laughs> Kenny says, I love the main event tonight was wonderful. The opposite of everything I didn't like about the Jungle Boy match. No needless blood or table stunts, just great wrestling. They told a great story and Quinn looked like a star. 10 out of 10. One question for you guys, if you haven't already talked about it. Is there any truth to the rumor that Adam Cole's contract is up in August? If so, do you think there's any chance he shows up on Dynamite? Uh, Mike Johnson just had a thing on that the other day, and he had reported he's got like 18 months left. So um, I I don't know that uh, myself, but I I would say Mike Johnson would probably have a pretty good handle on that. And even when that time is up, I, I really don't see WWE letting him go very easily. Like he is one of those names. I would say like he they, you probably extend this to anybody who they would deem important enough to give an NXT title run, much less the longest run that they've had in, in that belt history. I don't see them letting him go um, without, you know, making a very competitive offer. Yeah, he's one that I mean, I, I no, no one is a sure thing when you move them to Raw or SmackDown. But I mean, he is someone that I mean, you can see they have all the confidence in the world in that guy. But I would s- yeah, you, know, you, you can't really predict where someone will be a year and a half from now. But I mean, uh, w- whenever his, his deal is up, I mean, it, it's always it's always better when you know you do have options out there. But he is one that I mean, he's he's done tremendously well there. Yeah, uh, Rory from Poconos in Pennsylvania. Fun show as always. My favorite part of the show was when Darby Allen with Tony Hawk skateboarded off of the ladder, and when Brian Cage threw John Moxley onto the red car that conveniently had a Florida AEW license plate. Penelope Ford is looking better each week, and I'm excited to see her continue to develop. Jericho yelling cannonball was hilarious. Way and John, have you guys noticed how it seems like there are more and more fans in attendance at these shows? I'm curious if they are, if they are actually fans or independent wrestlers, and I'm curious if they are also being tested. I don't know about the people in the stands. I would think that everyone that's on, like, this is still like a closed set that I would think they are being tested. Yeah, yeah. And I I wonder, you know, if we will continue to get updates. I mean, as rules start to relax, certainly like in in Florida and elsewhere in the world, will AEW see less of a need to, I guess, you know, live up to these very strict, I think, guidelines, uh, strict, you know, compared to everybody else. 
But like WWE is being allowed to not do any sort of testing or at least, you know, nothing beyond um, temperature checks. And no one's criticized or at least like they haven't gotten into trouble with any uh, governing body. So at some point, will AEW, you know, keep it up because they feel like it's the right thing to do? Or will they, you know, start to relax their their own measures? Yeah, uh, and I, I really don't think we're, we're t- like, it seems like we are not that far away, I think, from having fans in in florida even it's if it's a small limited number i I think that that's that's where things are probably going yeah yeah all right finally we got a doug from tupton class oh sorry that's not finally at all we have a few more okay so uh strap in everybody doug from tupton classic another great dynamite tonight which got off to a, a fiery start and kept rolling throughout the show I found myself really high on almost everything, with the only real letdown being Mark Quinn's nature as part of a very spot-oriented team showing through a bit in the main event, which was still a fun match regardless. FTF, FTR versus Butcher and the Blade was a perfect introduction to the show and the team both. The group of women we've seen, seeing, we've been seeing since Double or Nothing seemed to be gelling nicely, and though there were a few timing issues, the level of athleticism on display improves weekly, with the matches benefiting from it. The trio's match was very enjoyable, and the beatdown of Orange Cassidy pose match added a more serious dynamic, which the inevitable Jericho Cassidy match needs as it builds. Video packages, interviews, and other segments were all of the usual high AEW quality, and I thoroughly enjoyed the show. 8.5 Blood Oranges out of 10. All right. Uh, Raymond loved the, the Blood Orange angle and Mark Quinn. And then we go to Noah from Vaughn here. Awesome edition of Dynamite, which started off with an excellent tag match and closed with a great championship match. In both cases, the losers of those matches were not hurt one bit by losing. I really like the direction they are going with the Dark Order and bringing Colt Cabana into the mix. The dynamic there will be interesting. The pace of this show was fantastic and did a great job of progressing the stories and feuds heading into Fighter Fest. Eight and a half out of ten show for me tonight. And with them only using or only having two more episodes left until Fighter Fest, I gotta say, I've been impressed with how they have built up those shows despite only having five weeks to build it up compared to pay per views of which they have months to promote it. Thank you everybody for your feedback. Oh, jeez. Uh oh. Did coffee fall? Uh no, it was not coffee. <laughs> it was a. Uh... I have some audio um, soundproofing material, and it just fell off the wall right now. So I uh, almost made it through the entire show, but apologies for, for that. Hey, before we go, I wanted to make mention this year, up next, first of all, they've opened up a brand new Facebook group, which you can join. And it's not any group, John. You got to you gotta, you gotta join this, and you have to answer a skill testing question. So they're not allowing anybody to join this. It's a very exclusive club. But you can find it at facebook.com slash upnextpodcast. And they are holding a New Japan Cup bracket challenge this year. So uh, John Sino, our good friend of the show, is running Up Next's social media. And he's made a post about this on our forum, forum.postwrestling.com. Just go to the Up Next New Japan Cup 2020 bracket challenge. And you can fill out your brackets. You can submit it to John Sino on the, on the Up Next Facebook group by sending him a DM by Sunday, June 15th. That's this Sunday, isn't it? 10 p.m. Uh, June 14th is this Sunday. Oh, so he's he needs to update this thing. Uh, it's either the 14th so, or the 15th. Get well, it it's got to be Sunday because, well, um, the New Japan Cup doesn't start till Tuesday, but let's assume it's Sunday. <laughs> just, yeah, know. just be just be a cater and get it done early uh, by Sunday at 10 p.m. And uh, fill out your, your brackets and then send them to him. On the Up Next uh, Facebook group. And the winner will receive a gift from Up Next. And uh, Thursday night, we'll have the new British Wrestling Experience show out as Martin, Jamesy, and Benno are going to be joined by Andrew Thompson, who is going to go all the way to Europe. And then he's going to come back to do Rewind to SmackDown Live with Wei Ting on Friday night at 10.15 p.m. Eastern Time, live for all members of the Post Wrestling Cafe. It is Andrew Thompson Live. Just a globetrotter, that man. So, yeah, a lot of Andrew this week. And then this weekend, what do we have? Uh, Total Recall, the season finale, uh, will be out on our Patreon. Uh, it'll be me and Pauline talking about the gender reveal of Artem and Nikki's baby. I oh, can't... what do you think it is? Ooh. Um, have you ever gone to a gender reveal party? I've never, actually. Did you have one? No, I didn't. I didn't. I wasn't interested in uh, doing one of those. But uh, yeah. we, we didn't. Um, uh, we I, I waited. Like it that's was a, a, like a surprise. We we didn't is, know. Is aren't gender reveal parties like a relatively recent thing? 
They must be. I've gotten the one. A friend of mine did one. I mean, right. it's just it's just a party. That's all. Um, any excuse to have a party, right? I'm going to predict that they're going to have a boy. You want to put money on it? Uh, no. I will put I will put a coffee on the line. But I don't know when I'm ever going to see you again. Like yeah, it could be year, years before I ever see you again. So, um, I, I, what do you think it's going to be? Are you going to just? I'm going to say girl then, just to play devil's advocate. Let's let's you know let's we'll see who's right. This might get me to watch the show on Thursday, well, or at least the last ten minutes of it. Well, you got to prepare for this book review. You better. That's up. true. That's true. The 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 post wrestling book club. It's coming, everybody. The Bella's book might be our our first uh, subject. So. Uh, yeah, dude, I, I don't have, I am not going to be back until Sunday night. This might be the longest gap in the history of post wrestling for me from Wednesday to Sunday. Well, it's a much deserved break and, and everybody, I think wants you fully refreshed because on Sunday we are back for WWE backlash. It's the greatest wrestling match ever. And what of all time, the greatest ever, we will have a frame by frame analysis of Randy Orton versus Edge, Sunday night, live for Double Double, Ice Cap, and Espresso members. So as soon as Backlash is over, log in, and you can watch the post show with Way and I, and then call in if you so choose. I, I think Edge is having a breakdown on Twitter over this this tagline. He's oh, just God. been taking the piss out of this whole thing for like the past two days with every tweet. It's it's hilarious. <laughs> Uh, we, we will also make mention that Monday night uh, on Rewind to Raw, we're also going to review the Together Project show that New Japan is doing Monday morning. So double review on Monday night. Yes, that's right. And again, uh, MCU review this coming Tuesday. So if you have some free time this weekend, rewatch Endgame, leave your feedback on the forum, and uh, listen to us talk about it then. All right. That's going to wrap it up for Rewind to Dynamite. Thank you for listening, and we will speak with you later this week.